This podcast is intended for educational purposes only. Advice should be sought about your specific matter. No attorney-client relationship is formed between any client and attorney Don Dennis until there is a signed engagement agreement and payment of an initial deposit. No client consultant agreement has been formed between any client and an Inverted Chaos Incorporated until there is a signed agreement and payment of an initial deposit. Welcome to the show. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. I'm your host, Luis Hurtado, a designer and animator living in Los Angeles, specializing in creating user interfaces and motion graphics for television and advertising. Previously, I have freelanced as a visual design lead at several of the top tech companies and TV networks, including Amazon, Hulu, and NBC Universal. Don Dennis is a Los Angeles-based attorney that specializes in internet law and intellectual property. He assists clients of all sizes, from startup companies to established corporations. Attorney Dennis is also a professor of law and enjoys explaining the law in plain English. Attorney Dennis obtained his Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering from Northwestern University and his Juris Doctor of Law from UCLA. So this case is really interesting. Uh, this lady was riding a horse, uh, had a horse accident, and uh, suffered traumatic brain injury, uh, then proceeded to uh, sue the horse owner uh, because of, you know, her personality and her, the way she perceived life and felt about things changed after the horse accident. Um, the, the court then asked her to show uh some sort of proof and she showed her facebook profile as uh, before the accident she was posting a lot more often and after the uh face after the accident uh her facebook uh activity changed well yeah basically what the lady was saying is because she fell off the horse now she's unable to do all of the same things she used to be able to do and you know it takes her longer to think it takes her longer to, you know, get her ideas together, to write stuff out. She can't write without misspelling several words. And she used to be on Facebook all the time, documenting her life and participating in sports activities and other leisure activities. And now since she got injured, you know, everything's taking a different turn. And so, you know, she was suing because she was injured. So the other side is like, okay, well, if you're suing because you're injured, then we want to make sure that this is not fake. You know, like you can really prove you were injured. And since you're seeing you used to post on Facebook all the time real fast, well, we want to see your Facebook posts, including your private messages. So the court asked for her Facebook. She didn't voluntarily hand over uh, that content, right? Well, you asked me two questions. You said the court asked for her Facebook, and then you said she didn't voluntarily. So yes, Obviously, she did not want to share her private messages because, as you know, most people, they're private or DMs for a reason. Because despite the song, it goes down to the DM. Nobody necessarily wants to publish what's going on in the DM. They just want to let it go down in the DM between two different people. So now it's basically putting off to the world what goes down in the DM because for the simple fact that court records and most court files, unless they are under a protective order, are public information. So anybody can go read the transcripts and see what's going on. And so, you know, she obviously wasn't going to offer that, but the other side wants to substantiate, you know, their defenses because they're trying to prove, you know, she really is not as hurt or injured as she claims to have been injured. And if we can get evidence out of her direct messages, for example, evidence saying that you know, showing that her activity is still the same, that she's really not having to slack off since the accident, you know, that would greatly diminish her case. So if she weren't willing to hand over her private DMs, um, she the court would see that as like she's obviously faking it, right? Well, they won't jump that far to a conclusion, but you know, the first step is to identify the information that would help the defense come up with um, help the defendant. I mean, help the other side come up with a defense to those claims that she was injured. So first, but the issue is in this case, 
is, you know, people have claiming a right to privacy and the whole thing about discovery, which is, you know, trying to get evidence to substantiate either side in a, in a case. And so how far are you willing to let that go? Because the court doesn't want someone just going all through the direct messages, looking at things that have no relation to a personal injury. So, for example, if they start going through direct messages and they find romantic uh, communication between the person and, you know, their boyfriend or girlfriend or what have you, that really has no bearing, per se, right off the top with a personal injury claim. So they want to be fair to allow the information and evidence that's reasonably calculated to be material, meaning mean something in this matter to come forward, but at the same time, still give people a right to privacy and stay away from things that have nothing to do with this. So that's where the court, and so they had, and this was a big issue because the court is like, well, how do we rule on this? Because in generally, in general, the way it works is anything that's reasonably, you know, calculated to lead to, you know, something that bears material to the case is okay to look for. And you don't have to necessarily know that it's going to be there. It's just you have the opportunity to look for it. But in this situation, you know, you don't at the same time want to open it up for people to just read all the messages and they have no bearing on it. So that's why it was a tricky situation. The court was trying to come up with a standard as to what's fair and what's not fair. Mm. So while reading through this case, uh, I came upon a couple of terms that I don't, I think most people uh, may not know that the exact legal uh, definition of uh, what is what is discovery and what is disclosure? Are they are they the same terms, just two different ways? Or well, disclosure is actually the unveiling of the information. Discovery is how we go about looking for it. So, for example, you know we can discover things through um, asking questions of one side or the other and doing a deposition where people have to sit down before the attorney and ask questions and answer questions or doing um, interrogatories where one attorney sends the other attorney questions and they want the client to answer those questions. For example, did you do this? Did you do that? Things of that nature, and they want you to admit it or, or deny it. And so this whole process is called discovery. And discovery is basically someone, first off, someone sues someone, right? And then, like, for example, you don't know all the information necessary to prove your case, but you go through discovery to get as much information from the other side as possible. And that's how you're helping to develop your case, because you have to have facts. You can't just walk in court and say, someone owes me a million dollars and they should pay me because you feel like it. You have to have evidence. And sometimes you don't have all the evidence, but you think the other person may have it. And so if it's material, meaning it bears a significant you know, value to your case, you have the right to obtain it unless it's like attorney-client privilege, unless it has no bearing and, and things of that nature. And so that's how this discovery thing came about, because this particular in this particular case, the individual did a lot of posting. They talked a lot about their life on Facebook. So if you're the other side and you're trying to prove, hey, they're really not as hurt as they are, and they're always on Facebook, and, and they also said they haven't been able to post on Facebook like they used to, then let's see, let's let's take a look at Facebook. So basically, you're kind of leading us to where we need to go here from the other side's point of view. And now all of this is called the discovery period, and it occurs for the most part before you go to trial. And so why is it important? It's important because, let's say, you know, you say that, uh, you ever heard of people going out on disability on workers' comp, and they say they can't work? Okay, well, let's say you say, I'm out on workers' comp, I'm sick, you know, and I need to get paid. And so you go home and, you know, you're getting your check every month. And the company is a little suspicious as to if you're really injured. So then they send an investigator out and they start taking pictures. And they see you at mountain riding all the rides with your hands up in the air, having a good time. And then they see you going swimming and jumping in a pool. Then they're going to say, well, you know what? I don't really think his back is injured. So then, you know, they'll formulate the case and they might sue you and, you know, things of that nature. And it's all part of the discovery process where all of this information will come out. So that's why it's important, because when people have claims for things of that nature, you know, you need to get that evidence. So basically anything you post on the Internet, whether it's public or private, especially considering that it's private, you should really be quite aware of that uh, because it could be admissible in court in the future. And see, that's 
And that's why this case is so important, because although it's a New York state case, meaning that the law is only applicable in New York, oftentimes what happens in one particular state can set precedent, not set precedent, but it can kind of influence other states. Because when other states are dealing with the same situation, they'll say, okay, well, how did this state handle it? Or if we have never handled it before, or what is a good practice? And they might use some of this to adopt it. So it could. Think about, in some states, it's illegal to be in an adulterous affair. In California, you know, we're no fault. All you have to do if you're getting a divorce is, you know, check the box, irreconcilable differences. Well, actually, a disillusion of marriage is what it's called. Check the box, irreconcilable differences, meaning we don't get along. We don't want to be involved anymore with each other. And you don't have to even say why. In other states, you know, that you still necessarily might have to say why you're getting a divorce. In other states, divorce is a crime still. Now, whether or not it's enforced on the regular is something different. However, let's say you live in a place where adultery bears, you know, has an impact on the divorce. And you want to say, well, you know what? I should get more of a settlement, meaning more of a cash payout at divorce because, you know, this person, my partner, was unfaithful. Well, you know, you say, well, how can you prove it? Well, I don't necessarily have text messages, but I think they were talking to him on Facebook. And I know my partner is very active on Facebook. Well, you might be able to get a discovery order if they don't want to turn that over. So you can look at the messages between a certain time frame, because in this case, they didn't let them look at everything. They just let them look after the accident in a certain time frame to see, you know, if you find any evidence of adultery. So it could lead into the area of adultery. In addition, it could, as we talked about personal injury, it could go into, you know, someone was injured and you know whether or not you were really hurt because of your activities, things of that nature. And you obviously know, well, maybe some people don't know, the police use, and they sometimes look for warrants to get information like this when they're looking to prosecute people for alleged crimes and schemes and things and plots and stuff like that. So it it can go a multitude of ways. And so the reason it's important also is because now people may want to think twice about what they post. And let me ask you a question from a technology standpoint. You know, is information that you put in your DMs or your emails, you know, how easy is it for someone to tap into that or to hack it to get that information? It's pretty easy, especially if you're on a public Wi-Fi. Let's say you're at a coffee shop and... uh you log on to their public Wi-Fi, anybody who's on that network as well could gain access to um, the images and text and uh, whatever you're browsing currently. Um, I would be very cautious, uh, especially when you're on a public Wi-Fi, that um, someone could gain access to your content. So what? So obviously this case was concerning a Facebook situation. And what other social media platforms allow you to send out direct messages to people? Pretty much all of the uh, social networking sites allow you to uh, post private messages or, or DMs, direct messages as they're uh, called. <clears throat> um, so, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, um, Instagram, they, they all have that capability at this point. So I, I, would be, I would be very cautious at this point about the type of things you talk about um, publicly or privately. Um, in fact, ever since I was a kid, I would, I would always give myself this, uh, ask myself this question where, uh, would my grandmother be embarrassed reading this? And, uh, ever since I was a kid, that's kind of like the barometer. So a quick question, um, why would the court be interested in reading, um, the private messages? Uh, couldn't they just and like gain an understanding of the change in her personality from just from her public posts? Because maybe they would find conversations. Because, okay, well, let's talk about what can you put in those direct messages from a technology standpoint? What kind of things can be placed in a direct message? For example, can't you put, can you put photos in there? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> everyone knows what sliding into DMs is all about, which is... Um, be romantic? You know. Be sexy or something? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of people are going to be, they're going to be surprised that these uh, romantic conversations are now um, being publicly displayed in a, in a, in a court uh, matter. You could be sending, you know, intimate photos definitely through um, 
through private messages, DMs, and um, I'm sure a lot of people would not want to make that show up publicly. Okay, so you were asking why, if they can, if the court or anyone could just read someone's public page, if in fact their page is public, right? Because it could be a distinction where your page is private and only certain friends can view it in your place. So I think first and foremost, you know, if the court, if the person that we're talking about in this case, if in fact their page was a private page, then someone from obviously they wouldn't want the person that's uh, pursuing that's trying to get evidence against them to be able to see their posts. So first and foremost, if it in fact was a private page, they would want disclosure of that so they can go through and check out the posts. With respect to the direct messages, you know, if they said that, for example, they said, you know, they could no longer cook, they could no longer travel, they couldn't participate in sports, uh, they couldn't go to the movies, they couldn't attend the theater, do all the things like they used to do, and the court allows you to go through the direct messages, and you see uh, a message from someone, you know, in February or, I don't know, January, saying, oh, let's go see Black Panther, you know, I'll meet you at the theater, and they say, do you want to ride? No, I'm going to run up there, it's not far. Then, you know, that would directly contradict their claims. You know, if they say, you know, I, if they're telling the court they have brain injury and they, they have all kind of spinal problems, and then they're saying, well, let's go shoot some pool Friday night or let's go to Dave and Buster's or this and that, or I'm taking the kids to Chuck E. Cheese and I'm probably going to dress up, party and play games and do balloons with them, then that's going to directly contradict it. And if it's not on the post and they have pictures of the person or, you know, someone else tags them in pictures and they find all that, you know, that would directly contradict the claim. So when the claims start getting contradicted, people start changing their mind as to if they really want to go to court, because at this point, the trial hasn't occurred. We're just kind of developing our bargaining positions. So, for example, if you're suing for a million dollars and then we go through the discovery and you don't necessarily have all the evidence to back your case, you know, the other side may say, well, I, you know, your case is only worth five hundred thousand dollars. And then if you start realizing you know, or if, if, if traumatic information comes out where you, they can pretty much prove you weren't injured at all. They'll say your case is worth zero and we're going to move to settle, you know, dismiss it immediately because we have all this proof. So it starts, discovery is important because it makes people change their bargaining position. Or, for example, let's say, let's say the person, oh, let me, one more thing, let's say the person was legitimate and they went through the direct messages and there was no evidence that they were lying, no evidence that they were actually, you know, doing uh, activities that they said that they couldn't do, then the other side might say, hey, you know, so they're suing for a million. I don't want to take a chance of this going to trial because a jury might say, well, you know what? Their damages are worth five million or two million. So let's just settle and pay right now. So it kind of shifts people's bargaining positions. So you're going to want to hand over this type of information because it's only going to strengthen your case. That's right. And also the court is going to want to see that information too. Well, yeah, at this point, it's not necessarily the court as it is the other side wants to see it yeah, because it hasn't made it to trial yet. So that's the other side is interested. Now, what, what about, let's say, you know, you're in that situation and you're not sure if the court's going to allow the other side to look at the information, you know, what do, but you're a little nervous because, you know, you have some posts, some pictures up there. What, what do you think most people might consider doing? Hmm. Let's see. You got stuff in your DM. You got pictures of you hanging out, going to Magic Mountain. You going to an amusement park. You going shooting pool, but you're suing someone saying you can't do it. What do you think some people might start considering doing? Hmm. I think they might want to exercise some common sense in what they end up posting, right? I think you're right. But also, what do you think about them? I think some of them might consider deleting it. I see what you're saying. Uh, I never even considered that because I know just and anything on the internet is never fully deleted. Well, yeah, you're. Why, why don't you explain that? Why is it never fully deleted? Right. So, just because you think you deleted something off of your web page or profile, um, it's all it really is is just hidden from your view. Uh, it's still on the servers of those platforms. So, depending on how deep the pockets are of these people. Uh, that your opponents let's just say um, they can they could query those um, 
that data to, of those um, platforms and see if they can get that evidence overhanded to them. So yeah, I would be very weary on um, thinking that if you delete things off of your profile, um, that it's gone forever. Um, it's it's not. Uh, yeah, and what that's called in the legal world is spoliation. So think of the root word in there, spoil. So you're trying to spoil that evidence that people are looking for. And what courts typically do in all jurisdictions is they say, okay, well, we were looking for evidence that you actually were fine and moving around, and we have proof. We can show that you deleted it. So we're just going to say that it was there. So even if those posts had nothing to do with the case at all, uh, just because you deleted it and showed the intention of, hide, of trying to hide stuff. Yeah, we're just, the, yeah, the court's going to give a presumption that the reason you deleted it is because it was going to harm you. Because you are under an order, you know, attorneys are supposed to advise your client not to delete any of that information. So if you delete it, whether in this type of situation or any other type of situation, uh, you're, you know, they're going to rule that, hold that against you. So basically, once you are involved in a lawsuit, you are supposed to preserve all evidence, information, emails, things of that nature that might reasonably relate to it. You can't just start deleting it and say, oh, well, you know, I deleted it, but it didn't really bear on it. You, you don't have the right to make that decision because they feel that that's unfair to the whole process. And if you do, then we'll just presume that, you know, it was there and that's why you did it. They're going to presume the worst. Yeah, they presume the worst. And hold it against you. And hold it against you, yeah. So let me ask you a question. With Snapchat, don't those posts delete? That was the original concept of the, of the app, but they've since stopped doing that. Um, oh. Mostly because um, I would think that they, people realize that you could screenshot the photo and just keep it locally at that point mm. so um yeah that's that's not a, no longer a, a thing okay i think like we, well based on what you said in terms of information never did really disappears and it's going to be held on a server somewhere i think you should operate with that idea in mind before you decide to post or put anything up there you know i i mean yes it's just i think People are fooled because you just have your phone in your hand and you're thinking it's just me and my phone and this person, or you're just at your computer. People aren't, may, don't have to be around you when you're doing things. So maybe you have a false sense of hope or a false sense of courage that, you know, it's private, but it's called the World Wide Web. So it's people, you know, on the dark web all over the world that can tap into stuff and get into information. So if they can hack into the Army's website, if they can hike into all these corporations, websites and servers and things of that nature, why can't they hack into your simple little account and get information? So I think you have to operate with that presumption in mind and say, okay, if whatever I post, would I have a problem if everyone saw it? Right. So it goes back to the, would my grandma be embarrassed seeing this principle, <laughs> which, um, you know, we should all uh exercise a little bit of classiness when um uh when we're posting things in the future uh i think yeah yeah so i wanted to add something and looking at the case the court said just to get started when they're deciding whether or not you know someone should be allowed to look at private messages direct messages the initial test is not whether the information is private but whether it's reasonably calculated to contain relevant information. So they don't care if it's private. And, and, you know, that's what the court said. It doesn't matter if it's private. It's whether it's reasonably calculated to contain relevant information. What's reasonably calculated? Reasonably calculated means in this situation with this horseback rider, can they look at all the Facebook, Facebook posts ever posted by the person? No. They're talking about they specifically claimed after the accident they were injured, after the accident they couldn't do certain things because of their injury, so we want to look at Facebook activity after the accident. So that's when we're talking about reasonable calculations. So the court talked about setting up time limits. It also, they talked about what the nature of the claim is. For adultery, they might allow certain things if the state is not a, a no-fault divorce. divorce. 
and with a personal injury, they might allow you to look into other things, but it has to be relevant to what the lawsuit is about. And then also the time limits. So, and then also first and foremost, is it even relevant? So, you know, that is, um, that is the main gist of it. So as you were saying, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, this can set has, you know, a wide ranging effects all over. And a lot of times law concerning the internet originates here in California, especially with things that go on in Silicon Valley or Silicon Beach. And then also New York is often at the forefront of different things that pop up. And other states throughout the country kind of follow the lead. So this is a personal injury case. Could could that apply to other cases in the future, other types of cases? Well, for now, it only it occurred in a personal injury. However, it's New York law. So they didn't craft a rule and say it's only, you know, for personal injury. They just said this is how we're going to do things that are similarly related in New York. So that's why I gave the example. If a situation, for example, came up with an adultery case in New York, maybe they might look at that. If a situation came up where someone was suing someone, for example, saying, uh, oh, a perfect example. Let's say someone goes to a, a Macy's or a Nordstrom's in New York and they are accused of shoplifting and they're taken to a back room and held against their will and they sue the department store for false imprisonment, you know, which is a crime, but I mean, which is, they're suing for money. They're not suing in a criminal court. You know, they're, they're not in a criminal court, they're suing for money. So they're saying, you know, because you had me in the back room, it was Christmas time, I missed out on taking my kids to see Santa, I was scared, I was traumatized, I don't even wanna to go to that mall anymore things of that nature, and they won $500,000 because of the incident. And they were held in a room by security guards undercover for about an hour and a half, two hours. Well, you know, they might say, that, you know, the department store in defending themselves may say they're not really traumatized. They were right back at the mall yesterday because they had a blowout after Christmas sale. They did this, they did that. They're perfectly fine. And they may say, hey, I think there's evidence on Facebook. Turn over those private messages on Facebook. Well, it might be arguable that it's very relevant if they have any posts or direct messages from Christmas until right after. Because maybe you find a message saying, hey, meet me at 6 a.m. so we can hit the sales up. Things of that nature. So it really depends on the claim. And I, what I'm suggesting is if the other side says, no, you know, that's not fair, that's private, you're violating my rights, someone could grab this case and say, well, hey, you know what? In this case, although it was a personal injury, the court still said it was okay under certain circumstances to look at these posts and look at these direct messages. So slowly, that's how these things can relate and be applied in other areas. So this is a really important case. And at, th at this point so far, it's just been between the lawyers. No, no, no. It went to court. And the court, and the court ruled, at this point, the court ruled only on, they, not, they haven't even had the trial per se. They're just dealing with the discovery portion of it. They're trying to just get information. So it went through various courts in the New York Court of Appeals, which um, is a higher court than the lower courts because they have different levels of court. So the higher court made the decision, hey, you know what? Allow them to have that information because the lower court didn't agree with it. So what could this court case change for the future? So at this point, as I was saying earlier, I think it could just change the bargaining position because if the information comes out, showing that you know the person hasn't modified or they really haven't been able to do things and everything lines up with their argument, then the other side may say, well, you know what, if let's say there's an insurance company that's representing the owner of the horse, you may say, well, the insurance company may say, well, you know what, let's go ahead and settle because we don't want to risk going to court. Whereas if other information comes out and shows they really weren't injured, then, you know, the plaintiff, the person bringing the claim may say, well, you know what, uh, Instead of a million, why don't you just give me $50,000 and we'll call it even, you know, or we'll, or we'll drop the lawsuit. So this could have a wide ranging impact on the settlement negotiations. So this all came about because she was saying that her Facebook habits changed post accident. We, it, this came up because at the deposition, the plaintiff said she previously had a Facebook account on which she posted a lot of photographs showing her pre accident, active lifestyle, 
but she deactivated the account six months after the accident, and she couldn't recall, you know, if she had put any post-accident photographs up. So she, as you were saying, she said she had a very active digital life. She posted a lot of photographs, but because of all of her injuries, she's been unable to do it. So they're saying, well, let's take a look ourselves. Well, Don, <clears throat> this case could have some widespread repercussions in the future. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll hear some updates if things come about. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. If anybody would like to contact you, uh, where are they able to? If anybody is looking for me, you can find me at dondennislaw.com. dondennislaw.com. You also have a very active Instagram account. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Maybe I should not be active based on this case. <laughs> but yeah, I have up to date posts for business owners of new changes in the law on my Instagram account at attorney Don Dennis. All right. Thank you, Don. Thank you for being on the show. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a good one. All right. So that's our show. Next week, we'll be talking about legal ramifications of embedding a tweet on your website and what all that entails. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. I really appreciate it. We'll be getting better week by week. I appreciate you guys uh, listening to it. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. There's blog posts and more information at invertedchaos.com.